into the inner verse. Welcome to the one within all. It's me, your host, Chance. We are ready for the, actually, crazy enough, the first ever solo stream where I'm calling it an Interverse podcast. (laughs) The truth is I didn't have a guest lined up for this week's time slot, uh, doubled next week, which is great. And I had a lot of stuff in my research catalog that really wanted to get shared, so Spent the last two or three days really doing a lot of research and putting together the slides for this presentation. I've done this type of presentation before, but it's always been for somebody else's show. Like I was excited to be on some show that I loved and I wanted to make sure it was good. Yet, I've never gone through the effort really for my own show to do something like this, except for recently on a Vibrant. So uh, I'm really happy to see everybody here. I'm Loving all the names I see in the chat. Welcome, everybody. (laughs) You know who you are, but thank you so much for being here. Got a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to probably just go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, I'll introduce it as we go. But the topic at hand here today. Oh, and share share the stream if you're into what we're doing here. The topic at hand today is the Celestial Code of Scripture. Let me make myself big so I can show you the book. So I recently picked up this book by John McHugh, The Celestial Code of Scripture, The Astral Cipher Underlying the Miracle Stories of the Bible and Quran. I do like this book a lot. I'm only, I've only read one chapter, actually, but it's totally recommended. I think that anybody that likes the astro theology stuff that we talk about on this channel all the time should probably consider checking it out because we're able to analyze this stuff from the Sumerian side of the uh, equation. Now, to preface all this before we get into it, obviously, we're going to be talking about astrotheology. We're going to be talking about constellations. I will be bringing my own understanding of language to the equation, too. <laughs> and pardon me while I sip some cacao. I really want this feel-good, heart-opening cacao energy. Yeah. So (laughs) Dennis says on a chance gorge today, just finished the latest podcast with false reality check. Thanks for letting me know uh, that you checked that out because I meant to say here at the beginning, I'm really excited about the episode of false reality check that just came out today that I did with them. One of my favorite conversations I've ever had flow state wise about the topics of the savior, the Mercury, the Jesus. And a lot of that is going to be involved in this conversation too. But, you know, in either order, watch this stream and then go watch that or pause this and go check out the false reality check. They're going to definitely go together real nicely. So I need to get into some disclaimers though here. First disclaimer is that for the most part, I'm not really making claims (laughs) with this material, all right? We're making connections and observations of things that are whether or not things are interesting, right? I mean, they are interesting. That's why I picked them. But we're not making necessarily claims because a lot of this is coming from looking at cuneiform writing. And to even access cuneiform, um, which we'll talk about more as we go, it's a very academic thing. <laughs> like the uh, the academic archaeological 
university world pretty much runs that show. And there's a lot of contention about what means what. So we're making connections and observations that I find interesting, not making claims. Um, you know, it's like my buddy Dylan says with uh, when he's going to make a claim about something, there's three strikes. If you can find the physical artifact, if you can find the link in language that proves it, and if you can find maybe like some ancient writing of some kind, any three strikes, you might be able to make a claim. So anyway, just needed to make that disclaimer. Probably will make it <laughs> disclaimer <laughs> as in I'm not making claims. Ha, huh? disclaim. Right. So a lot of this presentation is going to be coming from the Celestial Code of Scripture, the book I just held up, and really just chapter one. So there's so much good stuff in there. The reason why I was attracted to this book was because even though I can't verify cuneiform and I can't verify the language system that the uh, Sumerians were using, the fact that it correlates so closely and like completely supports the whole astrotheology uh one world language, one world civilization stuff that we get into here all the time, especially me and Dylan. The fact that it supports all that to me is why it's interesting. So let's get into it. <laughs> I got a lot of slides. I, I really am glad that I took the extra day to spend more time on the slideshow because there's so much that got added. So the first question we're going to be getting into here <laughs> is a really big question. All right. Why did humans first begin to believe the unbelievable? All right. And I also want to say uh, Zello watch in the chat. Mellow out Zello, mellow Zello. <laughs> There's nobody messing with you, buddy. It's all in your mind indeed. So why did humans first begin to believe the unbelievable? Uh, well, I think we're going to answer that question with this entire observation of heaven is the sky as we go forward. but. I thought a fun thing to do would be to check out <laughs> what is a biblical miracle. So this is what I mean by believe the unbelievable miracle stories that are part of all scriptures, right? So let me pull this over. I am not attacking whoever Natasha Crane is. This is just what came up on a Google search. And I wanted to get like sort of a down to earth, you know, I mean, admittedly Christian, I'm not ripping on Christians here. I promise. I love you all. I'm only trying to expand people's minds. I think people who, come to this channel off and know that but i wanted to get a down-to-earth <laughs> christian mom thoughts is what this is labeled about what exactly is a biblical miracle so <laughs> she brings up the example of how did jesus feed five thousand people with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish and apparently her child responded he must have cut the bread and fish into tiny pieces to feed that many people that's hilarious. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, it's as evident and logical of an answer as possible. But what's important here about what miracles are to the average sort of true believer is miracles are supernatural. Well, there's a problem in that phrase in and of itself, in my opinion. Supernatural. Super is from the Latin same word, which means like above or beyond. So when we say supernatural, we're also saying metaphysical. It's actually pretty much the same word. I'm not disputing or debating with anybody about what is and isn't real in terms of the metaphysical realm. Uh, these are things that are so, they're beyond our knowing, right? So I'm, <laughs> so uh, I, I'm like, sorry, I got distracted by the chat. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really wanting to ground the type of research that I do in what we can actually observe in this shared reality, right? Because that's the only place where we can really make claims that are going to be observable and logical for all of us. Uh, people's subjective experiences of the metaphysical, people's theories about the metaphysical. I love all that stuff. Don't get me wrong. It's just not the same thing as making a claim about what is like actually factually capital T truth and the capital R reality. So miracles are supernatural. So she says here, a common pejorative statement atheists make is that Christians believe someone can walk on water, a dead man can come back to life, animals can talk, and so on. Well, you know, is it pejorative to just observe that somebody believes in stuff that they have no basis in their life to believe from their experience? Why would, why would the creator want us to 
believe things that couldn't be verified by our senses, why would we have the senses that we have? And why would they be limited to what they are? I don't know. But she says, Christians do not believe that miracles are naturally possible, just as atheists do not. Well, that's good. We agree on that. The point of difference is that they believe miracles are possible on a supernatural level. Well, that's true. They are possible on a supernatural level. What is a supernatural level? What's metaphysical, supernatural, above the natural, above the physical? It's heaven, which is the sky. So we'll get into that. <laughs> she doesn't even know what she's saying here. No offense, Natasha, but Christians believe miracles are possible on a supernatural level because the miracles are happening in the sky. And that's what we're going to get into here. Uh, miracles proved who Jesus was. We won't go on and on about this, but... Miracles are still historical events. This is important. Historical events. Why are miracle stories considered historical events? Why is so much of ancient history confused with mythology to the point where we don't even know <laughs> which is which? Uh, this is the point I wanted to get to, so I'll close this page. Yeah. All right. And good to see five people watching on Rockfin. There will be a segment of this show that goes to just Rockfin. I have no idea when I'm going to make that cut. As of no, I have no idea how long I'm going to be on this show. I have a lot of slides. Now, uh, we got right here a quote from the Celestial Code of Scripture, this book I just held up, where McHugh says in the beginning, a tacit century-old prescription against investigating the relationship between Mesopotamian astronomical knowledge and biblical and Quranic religious mythology has prevented modern scholars from seeing that this stellar cipher was the basis for biblical and Quranic miracle narratives. Stellar cipher. Obviously, we're talking about astrotheology. Somebody please kick the sexy sex bot chat out of the chat. Thank you. So if there was a tacit century-old prescription against investigating the relationship between astronomical knowledge and biblical religious mythology, and he's referring to in academia, that's going to be a big problem for our understanding of these things. And it's why this stuff is coming to the forefront in the last couple of decades as more and more researchers are on their own catching on, or they're going back to older sources that are now more widely available and accessible because of the internet. But this, this right here, the prescription against investigating the relationship between astronomy and mythology is exactly why you get articles like the one I just showed where somebody is like, you know, talking about how miracles prove the Bible was historical, which is kind of nonsense. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Why would I be sorry? All right. So here's a quote from Godfrey Higgins. Been really, really digging this book right here. Anacalypsis. It is thick and meaty gravy. Check it out from the 1820s. He says, neither Jews nor Christians will like to admit that the very foundation of their religions is laid in judicial astrology. Judicial astrology is the art of forecasting events by calculation of the planetary and stellar bodies and their relationship to the earth. The term judicial astrology uh, we won't read the rest of this quote. You can read it. But the point is that, you know, this is the astrology that it kind of is popularized now. People trying to predict like what's going to happen in the world or what's going to happen in your life. But judicial astrology was also where you get things like the book of Revelations and people's belief of like the end times. And that's all pretty obvious. I think a lot of people have caught on to that. But and obviously people in my channel probably know what I'm about to say, too. But this judicial astrology forward projecting into the future based on where the planets and the constellations are going to be. <laughs> Speaking of which, Dylan says there's an eclipse in like nine hours. Yeah. On a full moon uh, tomorrow and an eclipse tomorrow. I guess that's kind of have to be they have to go together. But more exciting to do the stream today because of the eclipse. Um, anyway. The point is that judicial astrology isn't just about forecasting events forward. It is also about looking back. And we'll get into that. So it's like, could you figure out history based on what's in the stars? I think no. <laughs> but the ancients seem to think differently. Um, all right. So 
Wise men on all continents have believed the constellations to be astral images of divine truth. This is a direct quote from McHugh here, that they were undeniable pictures or a stellar tableau of events from a bygone era. And then from the book, When the Stars Came Down to Earth, a cosmology of Pawnee Indians of North America. All that the stars did in the heavens foretold what would befall upon the earth. For as of yet, the earth was not made. Does that sound a lot like the chaos that Mario and I talked about last week? Because I think it does. In this image of the chaos, which I cut it off a little bit here, but if you remember or go back to that episode and check it out, you have all these main constellations all tied up with their adversary constellations in a chaotic, out of order mess. And this is before the earth was made. So very similar, actually, idea that the chaos, primordial chaos, actually had all the stars. The stars were still there before the physical, the metaphysical was still there. Uh, you know, then maybe that is referring to like the pattern that the physical realm is created out of, that that pattern already existed, that there was a logic to it. So I do recommend you go check out the chaos conversation with me and Mario. Super good. All right. So let's go ahead and jump into talking about one of the most famous miracle stories a little bit. Noah and the Ark. I don't have to tell anybody about the story of the Great Flood and Noah's Ark. Although I don't, I didn't find the quote because this book is so massive and I need to do a better job highlighting <laughs> and keeping close from this book. But uh, I'm pretty sure it's an anacalypsis that uh, the claim is made that the Phoenicians didn't believe the flood was a real thing, that they thought it, they were talking about astrotheology, mythology. Uh, and I agree with that. But before Noah, before there was Noah and his ark and his two of each animal, there was Utnapishtim. And before Utnapishtim, Utnapishtim from the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Babylonian story, there was Atrakasis or Atrahasis, depending on who you ask. But I, I like the K better, the K version, because Kasis, that sounds a lot like Kahos, K-A-H-O-S, is the Greek transliterated spelling of chaos. We say chaos, but it was more like kahos. I mean, it's still chaos. The point is, kasis and chaos sound a lot alike. And if the claim is that the world came from chaos, and even that there was two of every animal, that's interesting because if you look at that picture of the chaos, not that that picture is any kind of of historical importance other than it was an artist's version. Um, you know, there was all the signs were with their opposite sign, their pair. You know, their mate. <laughs> so my point is that if this progenitor progenitor character, Atracasis, that was the name of the Noah character in the Sumerian, the older, the oldest version of the Sumerian myth. He's basically like Adam, because after Adam, if that was real, if that was history, the line of humanity would eventually bottleneck again into just one guy and his family. Atracasis. So in a way, the world is coming from chaos, from Casas. I, I don't know if that, I'm not making a claim about that. It's just an interesting linguistic link. But <laughs> from this, from this, and we're going to later in the show, I don't know how much later, I forgot what the order of my slides are, but at some point, we're also going to talk about where the arc and that whole story lives in the stars. Very important. But from this story, you have now in modern times a su supposedly life-sized ark <laughs> like i think this is in kentucky or some shit uh i'm not making fun of these uh people that go here for fun i am making fun of people who built this to charge people money to go get on it i mean i don't know it's cool that you built this i'm happy for you but it's also amazing to believe that a big ass boat saved humanity and all the animals from a flood. I, it just logistically, you know, do, I don't need to make fun of this. I just, I just brought this up to show that like 
people take this shit so seriously that they built this huge thing right here. It's probably not the last, probably not the first or last time that somebody's going to try to build a life-size arc. So there's that. And let's also look at Atrahasis as a uh, a myth. I know we're going from Wikipedia, but there's not a lot of better sources on this anyway. Um, and I just want to look at the synopsis here. So in tablet one, you have the creation story of Anu, Enlil, and Inki, which is giving you a, a nice trinity there in the Sumerian. You have that Enlil created gods, like gods junior, as manual laborers. And then they rebelled, fallen angel style, and refused to do the hard work. So then they made humans to do the work. I know this is all sounding very Zacharias Sitchin Z. I'm not saying that this is accurate to what people really believe. This is a, what's out there, though, about <laughs> the myth of Atrahasis. Whether or not Sumerians really believe this, who knows? Whether or not this fucking tablet right here, like, look at that. It, if that somehow tells the story that I'm recounting from this Wikipedia page, that's amazing. But this is the claim of the mainstream, not my claim. Now, from this point, uh, the mother goddess, Mommy, makes the humans, Mommy, got to have a good Mommy, mother goddess, and they mixed the flesh and blood of with clay figurines, the flesh and blood of the slain god, jeshtu E or geshtu E, I don't know, meaning wisdom, apparently. <laughs> so... Uh, if you've heard me talking about the goddesses of wisdom in previous presentations, that's a whole side tangent. That's an entire show in and of itself. But suffice to say that when you hear of a goddess of wisdom that humanity is created by or comes from, you're talking the doctrine of emanations from the Orient. And it's basically at the root of all of the traditions. If you go back far enough. Now, in Tablet 2 of the Atrahasis, the human overpopulation problem comes up. So Enlil sends famine and drought. And it doesn't say this here, but in some uh, versions, he sends plague as well. Plague, famine, and, and drought, and then a flood. That sounds a lot like weather manipulation and <laughs> pandemics and uh, food shortages. <laughs> Are they taking their cues from cuneiform tablets right now in the world? Or is this just a thing that happens over and over again? Who knows? But Enki, one of the trinity here, who is similar to Prometheus, uh, defies the orders of the gods and saves mankind. And then tablet three is the flood myth. How, you know, we, uh, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to stop here. We, other than saying that Enki says, I made sure life was preserved. He tricks the other gods. Trickster, preserver, Mercury, Jesus, part of the Trinity, and he saves life. So there's that. Uh, now, back to your slides. Where are we at in here? All right. <laughs> Dylan says, waiting on actual people from that culture to demonstrate how they learned how to read a dead ancient language. <laughs> like that. Yeah, I mean, Dylan, to answer your question about, about that or your point, it's a fair point for sure. But uh, it is just as tricky or troublesome as like the Rosetta Stone. But basically they've got, they claim that they have like Rosetta Stone style lexiconal lexography dictionaries between Sumerian and Akkadian. Akkadian is more like I mean, it's considered a Semitic language, so it's closer to the other Arabic, Hebrew type languages. So I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting. Now, let's check it out. Where's this at in the sky? There's a lot more to this when we'll get to it. But I just want to point out that the uh, Akkadian star maps show the water god Inki, who's the preserver part. He is... He's shown with water emanating from a vase, right? And he's in the same spot as Aquarius. So there's that. Uh, Inky's other name is Ye, which sounds a lot like Ye or Yah. 
So there's that. Let's continue forward. Just want to point it out. All right. So now we're going to get into some of the parts of McHugh's book in the opening chapter where he talks about Native American mythology. Now, more disclaimers here. <laughs> this is coming from modern people talking about their people's ancient culture. And a lot of the researchers are coming from very grabbler esque, you know, <laughs> Jesuit adjacent or university sources of academia, which are all, of course, grabbler adjacent <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Just laughing at the comments here. Nice one, Lucas. That's hilarious. All right. So we are, it is interesting though, to get into some of this Native American mythology because uh, how in some ways it syncs with the European systems. It's not a hundred percent match, but the fact that they have so many similar beliefs and rites and rituals and even ways of like conceptualizing constellations, there's too many things that are similar or the same for it to be random chance, in my opinion, allegedly. So <clears throat> in her exploration of Navajo celestial mythology, anthropologist Trudy Griffin Peace in 1992 reports when all the stars were ready to be placed in the sky. First woman who is both human and deity said, I will use these to write the laws that are to govern mankind for all time. These laws cannot be written on water as that is always changing its form, nor can they be written in the sand as the wind would soon erase them. But if they are written in the stars, they can be read and remembered forever. Thus, the Navajo thought the constellations represented immutable pictographic laws. That sounds a lot like the Zodiac, where basically the laws of nature are encoded in the story of the ecliptic. And first woman... Especially the part about laws cannot be written on water and, um, you know, yada, yada, as it goes on from there. It is very similar to the Nag Hammadi uh, untitled origin of the world story translated from by UNESCO. <laughs> very similar. I'll just say that there. I mean, this is just a one paragraph quote para paraphrasing the whole creation story, but I, I imagine if we went further into it, if we had access to more of it, there'd be even more similarities between this and the doctrine of emanations from, you know, Pistis Sophia on down. Uh, it's very, very similar. We'll just leave it at that. Now, um, okay. Now we're going to, this is going to seem like a jump, but there's a lot of stuff this is connecting to. So Quoting our friend Dylan here from book four, A God's Acre for Winds of the Soul, book four of the Spirit World series. What is the word for black in Gaelic? Gaelic, dub, D-U-B-H. Are B and V interchangeable? Yes. Are H and E interchangeable? Yes. Will you concede dub is dove? Or is that too ridiculous for you? Close the U and dove, D-U-V-E, becomes dove, D-O-V-E. The word for black and the word for dove are the same word in different languages once you understand philology. Language in its infancy and the symbolism encoded in word creation. This, remember this, because a lot of why this is important is going to come back later in the slideshow. In fact, I probably should have put this slide somewhere else, but anyway... <laughs> <laughs> We're looking at the stars now in the Big Dipper, all right? So the Big Dipper has a star in it called Dub, D-U-B-H-E. I'll get into that more in a bit. Also, I'm put in here the English name for Ethiopia. The English name word, Ethiopia, is thought to be derived from the Greek word uh, eth <laughs> Ethiopia. And from Ethiops, an Ethiopian derived from the Greek term meaning of burnt, which is uh, 
Aith, A-I-T-H, and Visage, Visage, Face, which is the uh, Omicron Psi OS. So, or P-S, O-P-S, really. So basically, an Ethiopian is somebody with a burnt face or a black face. Black, pe black people, black folks. So there's more to this, and we'll get into why I even brought this up as we go. <laughs> the Hebrew word for dove is yuna, which is almost identical to yoni. Again, I might need to return to these slides and show you this again later. Um, here you have the Thoth tarot with the mother goddess. Here you have Starbucks. <laughs> here you have the high priestess card from some random tarot deck that I found online that shows the Gorgon. All of this is going to come back later. I'm just, you know, I want this stuff in your mind before we go forward. All right. So now why did I show you Ursa Major a few slides ago? Because we're going to talk about Ursa Major, of course. All right. So Ursa Major, the bear that rotates around the pole star, is Callisto, actually, in Greek Greek. Gleek, I did the LR switch there, Gleek. Gleek mythology. Let's look at it. Okay, so this is from uh, a website that compiles star myths. So none of this is claims. This is just what's out there about the, myth, the myths. It's coming from, although all this seems to fit. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of different myths of Ursa Major. First of all, of interest is that the there are no bears in the Mesopotamian star charts. So in the Mesopotamian, which is what we're going to be talking about a lot here, the uh, chariot, it's more of a chariot, apparently, and is associated with the lady of the open field or lady of the wind. So uh, we have a goddess up there, kind of like our goddess of Callisto. I didn't explain the story of Callisto, but let me back that up. I'll read this passage about Callisto. Callisto was a nymph or else a daughter of either Lycaon of Arcadia or Nictius of, of Cetius. Callisto was one of the goddess Artemis' huntress companions and swore to remain unwed. But she was loved by Zeus and in several variations of the legend was turned into a she-bear either by Zeus to conceal his deed which is uh infidelity from hera or by artemis or hera who were enraged at her unchastity so uh, interesting too that uh, <laughs> zeus got all up and close with callisto by turning himself into one of her hunting like girlfriends i guess and so it was like there's a lot of ancient art where they got excited about putting zeus as a naked woman with naked Callisto and is interesting because it backs up the claim that is made often by ancient writers that Zeus was a man and a maid. But part, there's a lot of reasons to bring up this Callisto story. Uh, there's Arcus, the child that Zeus had with Callisto who was given to the Titanus Maya to raise. Hmm. Who else do we know who was raised by Maya? Or Mary. I'll give you a hint. It's Mercury and Buddha <laughs> and Jesus and many others. Uh, so that's not a hint. I just told you. We're going to get more into Arcus later. But uh, back to the Sumerian. This is an example of how pretty much like it seems that the majority of the Greek a uh, catalog of stars is pretty much coming right from the Mesopotamian. Mul, Ap Mul, Mul Apin, Mul Apin. I don't know. That's the name of the star catalog that is always referenced. So if the consort of Ninlil or the, uh, the female who's represented by this Ursa Major to the Babylonians, Lady of the Wind, that sounds like the consort of a wind and storm goddess to me, which Callisto was the consort of Zeus, who is a wind and storm god. So anyway, it's the same thing, basically. Uh, in ancient Egypt, the Big Dipper was the thigh or the ox leg. The thigh symbolism is interesting. 
especially because um, Sagittarius gets associated with Jupiter later on, the constellation Sagittarius being uh, representative of the thigh. But that's just a little, you know, correlation, not the same thing. But the other part, the other story that's worth talking about maybe is, and I have it saved on my phone, so I'm just going to pull it up on there. I didn't put it in the slides. There's always more. <laughs> uh, let me get this. Yeah. So this is from the Phenomenon, Phenomenon, <laughs> Phenomenon, I think, by uh, Aratus, and I believe like 300 BC or something. And he talks about how the when Zeus was a baby being hidden from his father, Saturn, uh, he was kept in a cave, a cave, and it was in Mount Ida. And the Curates were warriors that were put to work to deceive Cronus, Saturn, and keep him from noticing Zeus was in the cave. So they were like clanging their shields and their spears at the entrance to the cave to cover up the sound of the baby crying. And they put, uh, as their reward, was they were put up in the sky as the Big Dipper and Little Dipper, or some major, or some minor. So they were called Hellice or Hellas. Hellas, interesting name, H-E-L-I-C-E. -E. And the other one was called Sinosura. So right there, Sura, Sura and Hellice have a lot are very solar names, actually, which is interesting. I have not been watching the chat, by the way, guys. So I hope you guys are having fun in there. <laughs> All right. So there's a lot more to go. I'm going to just keep going. All right. So this is where we get back to the Big Dipper here. We'll come back to this slide. There's a lot of language here. But the dub constellation here in the Big Dipper, dub is dove, is black, is yoni. Um, <laughs> that's some stuff that I learned from reading one of Dylan's books as well. Uh, why is it, why is dove and yoni the same thing? We're going to find that out later. And obviously black and dove in the Gaelic are similar, but I found it interesting that dub, D-U-B-B, -B, is the Arabic word for bear. So there's the dub star in the bear constellation. Uh, the Egyptians called the star dub, ak, A-K, which meant I. Interesting because O-C, ak, is the root of oculus, which means, you know, I. Is an I like a yoni? <laughs> Does it have black in it? And Dylan says, <laughs> Dub Dubim are she bears in Hebrew. Yeah, good stuff. Now here's another star that's in there, Merak. Merak. So Merak has a lot like Mera, Mira, Mary, Maya. We're not far off here. And then Mer plus Ak. Hmm. So are we talking about the eye of Mary, the eye of Mare? Would that be like the Yoni? <laughs> I, I mean, if this is a big goddess consort of the sky god, you know, that, you know, just became a bear later. Interesting stuff. And then Alcor. If you do that classic L to R switch in Alcor, A-L-C-O-R, you get Arcor, very close to Arco. And then Arcus, which is the name of the son of uh, Cal Callisto, is it? Whichever one of these. Which one of these girls that became the Big Dipper here? And so Arco, Arcus, Arche. Arcus in Latin means bow uh, with a U. Arcus with an A is the son of Zeus with this particular goddess. And interestingly, he was a hunter. And part of the mythology is that he was hunting and came across his mom who had been turned into a bear. And he got turned into the little bear because, you know, that's only fair. <laughs> Better than him, I guess, getting killed by his bear mom or him killing his bear mom. What have you. Now, since we're talking about bows, 
thought I'd throw in there that toxo is the Greek word for bow. There's a lot of gravy in that particular fact. <laughs> Very lots of lots and lots of gravy. Well, we're not going to go there, though. It's too much. Okay, so now let's look at the constellation Cassiopeia. The constellation is named after the queen of Ethiopia, Ethiopia. So that's why he brought her up. Interesting that the glyph in the sky looks like a W. And W flips upside down. It's an M. So, you know, she's a ma. Maybe she's a mom. Her story is that she was forced to wheel around the celestial pole on her throne. Spending half of her time clinging to it so she does not fall off her throne. Throne's going to come up way later. <laughs> Thrones. But uh, in Persia, she was drawn by Al-Sufi as a queen holding a staff with a crescent moon in her right hand, wearing a crown, as well as a two-humped camel. Well, that's interesting. Let's go back over here. Um, looking at the high priestess that Crowley put out there. Is there a camel in that? Interesting. And does her crown have a crescent in it? So maybe we're talking about the same monster mother, mother of monsters, just in a different spot. Now, this feels like a good point to put forward a theory that I have that might help make sense of this. Why we're seeing like possibly similar or the same characters, but they're different constellations at different times. So I have recently been thinking that when it comes to the story that's going on in the sky, why is it that like the savior characters like Jesus uh, seem to embody the whole story of the sun traveling across the ecliptic and parts of his story are involved in constellations that the sun doesn't touch if Jesus is the sun. So I'm thinking a lot of the ancient authors and Higgins puts this forward really clearly, would say that the sun wasn't God. The sun was the emblem or symbol of God or his chariot or his home. So what I am putting out there is just an idea, possibility, not a claim. You can put my name on it if you want, but <laughs> I'm thinking that in terms of the Trinity going on, that one way of looking at the Trinity could be that the one the supreme being, the deity of all, that was never depicted in images, no graven images of the main god, the top G, well, that could be the sky itself, the whole sky. And there, I have good reason for that, and we'll get to it. But if that's the case, then maybe the sun and the moon and the pole are the three beings that are part of the one or maybe the three zones of the sky are the three that are part of the one. And even stars and constellations themselves have Trinity aspects in and of themselves. It seems like maybe everything is Trinities within Trinities within Trinities in terms of how nature is structured. Could be. But I bring this forward because I'm seeing in Cassio Cassiopeia similarities to Cassandra or no. Callisto, <laughs> Callisto, not Calypso, not Cassandra, not Cassiopeia, and Callisto. <laughs> so many names to remember. <laughs> anyway, and in uh, the Navajo mythology that we have, shamans viewed Polaris as a fire pit, the pole star, or a hearth, while the Big Dipper was conceptualized as revolving male and Cassiopeia, his spouse, the revolving female. That's interesting as well. Um, just thought I'd put that out there. Now, in star lore among the Navajo, a Catholic priest named Berard Hale reported another Navajo myth that explained how the Pleiades came to appear on the temple of the sky god. The temple of the sky god. I'm going to get back to that. <laughs> when Black God entered the Hogan, which is a Navajo domicile, the Hogan of creation, P 
people noticed that the Pleiades constellation was lodged at his ankle. In the Hogan itself, he stamped, stamped his foot vigorously, which made the Pleiade bound to his the Pleiade bound to his knee. Again, he stamped his foot and caused the configuration to locate at his hip. His third tap brought the Pleiade to his right shoulder, much to the amazement of the creators present. But when he stamped his foot the fourth time, he located the Pleiade cluster along his left temple, and there, he said, it shall stay. So that's interesting. <laughs> uh, in terms of the temple of the sky god, the temple being like, you know, his head, Arche, the top, uh, there are there is a seven star system that's up at the top of the sky. If you look at this image, th this is not a claim. This is an image that's in this book. I have no other reference to the black god of the Navajo. Okay, just making observations here, but. If you see, this is very much like a pole, you know, in the middle here. Like, this is a dome. This is the sky. <laughs> is the black god the sky? Because the sky is black at night, right? I don't know. And the seven stars at his temple could be that Ursa Major we, ju we were just talking about. Because that's a seven star system, especially in like Chinese uh, mythology and star lore. They put a lot of emphasis on the seven stars of the, what we call Ursa Major. <clears throat> All right. So this also came from a Catholic priest, so who knows? <laughs> but it is interesting. Is that seven stars at his temple, the Pleiades, or is it Ursa Ma Minor? I guess Minor is the one that's right up at the top, not Major. My bad. But... In terms of uh, the crown or the arche of the black god slash goddess, it would definitely be Ursa Minor. Those are the seven stars that are up at the crown. Um, <clears throat> if you look at them too, the top here, this is the Pleiades stars, and this is Ursa Minor. So, you know, they both kind of look like a ladle. They're pretty close. Maybe this is just a mistranslation. I don't know. Spitball in here. And... Let's continue here from when the stars came down to Earth. In Pawnee thought, the planets were vibrant beings that had been deified with the very origin of mankind encrypted in a recurrent celestial tableau. Their shaman viewed the planet Mars as a divine warrior and Venus as a sacred but reluctant maiden. That sounds really familiar. Pawnee tradition holds that on his trek through the heavens, the warrior Mars confronts and defeats the rattlesnake, who is Scorpius. Scorpio, poisonous scorpion, or is it a rattlesnake that's poisonous? There's a lot of similarity there. In fact, in the constellation Scorpio, there was a little guy called Ophiuchus there, basically. So... <laughs> <laughs> we got a snake in that part of the world or a part of the sky in the European world as well. There is that. And then you have the bear. They're calling the bear Sagittarius. That's interesting. Uh, the Sumerian name for the Sagittarius constellation, the logogram for it was Pa Bill Sag. So I'm going to leave it at that. We could dig in. To so many of these things, though. Um, Auriga, the constellation Auriga. This is the charioteer, according to the Pawnee, according to this book by Von Del Chamberlain. They viewed Auriga as a panther. Now, that just is fascinating to me because one of the epithets of Jesus was Bar Panther, son of Panther. And Auriga is a charioteer in European lore well a charioteer starts with this root of car or char uh, and that is philologically connected to the idea of a carpenter in many ways a carpenter works with his hands your hands are like a vessel and they carry things around right they're how you they're how you make things so a uh, charioteer a chariot car is also a vessel so I'm 
just pointing out the interesting similarity there that maybe there's a reason why Ariga and Panther are, you know, in one part of the world, it's one and in the other, it's the other. And why Jesus was called Bar Panther in the more occulted. Oh, well, Dylan's got to give the obvious answer here is it's because Jesus is Bacchus, who is depicted with Panthers. They are the Pateres, the fathers, the priests. Well, yeah, <laughs> there's that. You know, you could go read Dylan's Spirit World books and learn all about that. <laughs> the wolf is uh, depicted, or Sirius is depicted as a wolf. That's part of Canis Major. Sirius, Canis Major, wolf, big dog. It's the same shit. Um, Procyon, Procyon, which is part of Canis Minor, little dog, was a bobcat. So is a bobcat like a little dog? I don't know. You tell me. So we're going to skip looking further into Sagittarius myths here. There's a, I had no idea how long this was going to take. So I maybe overloaded it here, but we can just look here at, um, Orion, who is the mighty hunter hero with, you know, to go back to the idea of Mars, the warrior. And there's the, the dogs. Here's Ariga. Interesting that in the old, you know, traditional depiction of him, he's got goats, even baby goats in his hand, in his hand, huh? Talking about hands. <clears throat> Who's a goat? Jesus is the goat. All right. So here we got the, uh, the gods of the Mesoamerican pantheon or a few of them. The rain god, Chak, or known in the Aztec as Talalak, whose goggle eyes represent Castor and Pollux, the brightest stars in Gemini. Why am I showing you this? <laughs> this slide might be a little non sequitur. I just thought this was interesting. Some of them might just be interesting and not as in flow with everything else. But in terms of this guy, Talak, Talalak, uh, it's not that far off from Thoth to me. And Gemini is Mercury and Mercury is Hermes and Hermes is Thoth. Talalak. Thoth, Talak. I don't know. Seems reasonable to me. Now we're back to Orion. Orion was called Warimi by the Barasana people of the Amazon in Brazil, according to an anthropologist. And here's the myth that is recounted about them. There were three men standing in a line, the three stars of Orion's belt. The middle man was bitten in a leg in the leg by a snake. This is why the middle star is smaller than the other two. The man's leg became bent and shriveled and became the ceremonial ads, which the Tatyo Tat? Who's Tat? Oh, that's Buddha. Name for Buddha. Tat. The Tatyo tribe wear the ceremonial ads on their shoulders during dances called dance ads. And ads is like basically a seven. <laughs> it's a tool that looks like a seven. The Egyptians had a, a tool called the ads, which they used for their opening of the mouth ritual. There's a lot to the ads. So, you know, if you're hip to that, then you know why I highlighted it. The theme of the shriveled, atrophied leg is found also in the character of Warimi. In part of the Warimi cycle of religious myths, Warimi is bitten by a snake, which causes one leg to shrivel up. At the end of the myths, Warimi took leave of this world and went into the sky. Hence his name, Warimi, he who went away into the heavens. So there's so much to this, uh, but... In the perception of the Barasana shamans, this ascension was factual because they can point to Warimi in the form of Orion, which stands in heaven. And from their perspective, he dies or he's like going under the earth. And then he's coming up again out of the earth and rising up or ascending in terms of, you know, what he does throughout the year. So what, fascinating that some people in Brazil are calling Orion war 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 isn't that a word for like a warrior a fighter a mighty a mighty one war seems too good to be 
it seems too good to be a coincidence to me. Now, the other thing about he who went away, what is a, what do you call someone who goes away into the heavens? I mean, onto the sea, maybe like a mariner. So mariner, wari, W and M are phonetically switchable. So warimi could be mariwi. <laughs> Mar, either way, war. If you see war, you got mar, in my opinion. And so a mariner goes away, and a warrior is a warion. There's just a lot of similarities there. It's worth looking at. What else we got? Where, uh, I want to hold up a bit. I want to see where I'm at in terms of how many slides I'm in. How many have I got left? <laughs> so I'm trying to decide where I'm going to cut between Rockfin and YouTube. Yeah, so this is slide, oh my, 21. All right, so we'll do some more. Um, we'll probably stop at around 26, 27, 28, somewhere in there. Well, not stop, but just go on to uh, Rockfin only side. Totally worth it, by the way. Mm -hmm. Mars is exclusively Phoenician, Dylan says. Cool. Well, Phoenicians probably went to Brazil. I am no. All right, so here we go. Well, let's look at uh, this idea of a hero getting put up into the stars, into the constellations. It's called a catastorism, the transformation of a hero or mythological creature into a star. Catastor, catastor ismi, catastor ismi is a lost work attributed to Eratosthenes of Cyrene, supposed to be the record of the Hellenistic assimilation of 48 constellations of the Mesopotamian zodiac. A euhemerism is the presumption that myths originated from real historical personages and events and have been exaggerated in the retelling. These are good words to have in your tool toolkit. Uh, <clears throat> because obviously a lot of what passes for history is mythology. <laughs> and in fact, all history is mythology when you really think about it because uh, you weren't there and no matter what somebody wrote down or what somebody remembered and told somebody else and then told their children and their children told their children, it's all myth at this point because we're only here in the now. Um, but it's good to realize that mythological creatures get turned into stars and then historical events get created out of the mythology that is in the stars. <laughs> yeah. Even George Washington is mythology. Exactly. 100%. <laughs> 100%. Now, if we look at the uh, catastorismi, it's interesting because it's not the only place where you get some like origins of uh, constellations for Greece. One of the Ptolemies has a work like this as well, but it gives you a list here of the major constellations that the Greeks had that they took from the Mesopotamian world. And a lot of it is just like a one-to-one. -one. So there's that. The <laughs> second half of this in the Rockfin side, we're going to get into a lot of the Mesopotamian goodness from John's book. But here is his big working hypothesis here. All right. Of John McHugh from the Celestial Code of Scripture. My working hypothesis held that Lumashi, or constellation writing, was considered the writing of the gods and comprised all of the constellations and planets, their images and their titles, and that wordplay encrypted within these constellation images and titles had served as the source of religious revelation. The images and puns were then arranged into coherent stories by the Magi and reported as facts. 
This was the revered meaning behind the cuneiform Amat Nisirti Pirishtu Sha Ili, which translated as hidden words are the secrets of the gods. Hidden words are puns. All right. If you've been reading Spirit World, or if you follow <laughs> the wild free association syncretism uh, that like me and Gabriel get up to here on Vibrance, we're doing that exact thing. We're looking for the hidden words, the secrets of the gods, the logos, reading between the lines. When uh, something has multiple meanings or it means one thing in one language, but another in another language, these astronomer priests would know multiple languages. And so they would be looking for the wordplay um, everywhere all the time, <laughs> but definitely in the stars and in the constellations. And they thought that they could figure out things that they didn't know yet by <laughs> they fig they could figure out things they didn't know yet by finding the hidden meaning between the lines of the in the constellations, right? This is great. Philology is lock picking. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. So an example here, though, is um, Scorpio chasing Orion across the sky. Uh, basically, as Orion is, you know, they're on opposite horizons. So as Scorpius is coming up, Orion's going down, you know, they're facing each other. They're facing off. Orion is Osiris. Osiris could be philologically construed to be HRS actually, or O series, son of the goddess series. Uh, now, I, Aphrodite, um, Venus, well, why I brought that up, I'm sorry. Why I would say Osiris is philologically HRS is because who who is Scorpius? It's Judas, I think. Could be wrong. <laughs> Pretty sure. Pretty sure that's the one of the 12. Um, and he's the one that takes out the HRS, which is the Christ character. And Horus, um, okay, here we go. Aphrodite slash Venus rules Taurus. And that is right next to Osir Orion or Osiris. Typhon chases the Typhon, who is like a Scorpius type figure, <laughs> if you will, especially if Scorpius could be a serpent. Typhon chases the gods out of Olympus. Aphrodite flees with her son, Eros. Eros is also HRS. There's a lot of stuff here. Oh, Judas is cancer, he says. Oh, no. <laughs> Either way, this is the type of thing they would do. They would come up with a story based on what they're seeing up there. A perfect example of this is the Tauroctony, which is when Mithras slays the bull. So Mithras slaying the bull... Do I have another slide on this? No. Okay, I'm going to tell you about this from memory. <laughs> Hipparchus was like f credited as uh, one of the people who started Mithraism. And the story goes that he noticed or was involved with the noticing procession of the equinoxes. So when he noticed that the sun was no longer rising in the sign of Taurus on the spring equinox, but now in the sign of Aries, he thought, oh, okay, so the laws of nature, the laws of heaven, the mandate of heaven has changed. And so there must be a new cosmocrator, which means like ruler of the cosmos. And he looked up there and he saw well, who's right above Taurus, the bull, who was the previous point of rising of the sun at the equinox? It's Perseus. Perseus is therefore slaying the bull. And <laughs> Dylan says, all this stuff is so modern that it doesn't really matter, to be fair, unless you're trying to uncover history, which none of it is. Well, yeah, we're just looking at it, <laughs> Dylan. Not making claims about what the original system was. Um, we're pointing out how these stories come to us by interpreting though the sky clock stuff. So Perseus is Mithra. And because Perseus was the one there up above Taurus when it was noticed that Taurus was no longer in charge, 
now we have the age of Aries and we have Mithraism, the new son of God, creator God. Look, you've even got the son to the left of him here. So Perseus is Mithra, who is the savior. Um, fascinating point that Perseus, the constellation Perseus in the Mul Apin, which is the Sumerian star codex, star map, Perseus was called Shugi, which meant old man. So Perseus was an old man. That I find interesting. Buddha means old man in Urdu, the Indo-Persian language of Urdu, which is a much older definition of Buddha than what you'll find if you Google etymology of Buddha, because it'll tell you that it means like awakened or something, which now it does. But in an older language, it was the old man. You can find out about this in Spirit World of God's Acre for Winds of the Soul. I'm going to quote it here. The Arabic word Sufi. Sufi sounds kind of like Shugi. The Arabic word Sufi pertains to wisdom and wool, but also fleecy clouds. A statue of Buddha with woolly hair would indicate a mystic or a wise old man. Sophia means divine wisdom. Ophis is a serpent, which are considered symbols of wisdom. The Sufis and Sophists are likely mystics descended from Buddhism, hence their wearing of woolen clothes. Yeah. All right. So there's a lot to that. <laughs> uh, the wool is an important symbol, though. I'm going to talk about this more in later slides. I hope you guys come over to the Rockfin side with me when we switch. Uh, okay. Bear with me a moment. Deciding my plan on the fly. Yeah, let's let's look at one more slide here. This would be a good stopping point. Here we go. All right. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So I'm going to quote Anacalypsis here from Higgins. He says, The prophecy of Isaiah may be said to have been a mystery, an example of judicial astrology, that at the end of the cycle a new would commence. The cycle of the god Krishna, the sun, would be born again. The day of the first birth of Buddha was at the vernal equinox when the sun entered Taurus of Krishna when he entered Aries. So we see the Phoenix imagery here. We're talking about basically that the uh, characterology of the savior is changing with the ages, allegedly, you know, if there is such a thing as procession. And I think we all probably are familiar with the uh, born of <laughs> a virgin symbolism but if not, we're going to talk about that in the second hour and show you where the manger and the virgin and King Herod and all that shit is up in there in the sky. So <laughs> uh, at this point is where I'm going to do a brief intermission. We're going to go over to the Rockman only side. I'm going to post a link to that in the chat. You will also be able to catch the replay of this on my Patreon if you'd rather join Patreon than Rockfin. But you know what they say, support what you like if you want and see more of it. And a lot of the good stuff is, you know, we just were building up to the foundational ideas and some of the more specific examples of the judicial astrology we're going to get into in hour two. We have a lot to go, a lot of fun stuff. So I hope to see you guys over there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm going to play us uh, out with an intro or an intermission song. And I'd love to do some sessions with you guys. If you want to do some one-on-one, -on -one, I'm available for tuning. Been having some incredible experiences with tuning lately. You wouldn't believe what kind of stuff we can find from 
your past that it's holding you back in terms of beliefs about yourself or experiences that you may have forgotten about. And I'm not saying you're messed up or broken, but you know, if you want to get more in tune, that's what it's about. Ask anybody that's done a session, go get into my telegram group and ask if anybody's done a session and tell, they'll tell you that it's very powerful and very fun experience and very worth it. Or you can do a uh, Oracle card, <laughs> I Ching tarot session with me. You know, that's not judicial tarot. I'm not telling you your fortune. We're just helping you figure out what you really think about things that you might be bringing to the question. So share this link on all your YouTube channels. Viewers help with the algos. Those damn algos. Yeah. Here's the link again. See you guys over on Rockfin. Thanks for tuning in. Looking forward to the second hour. It might be a little longer than an hour, but we'll see. Going to get into some great examples of exactly what we're talking about. And uh, much love, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. See you guys later, YouTubers.